Greetings everybody, so today we're going to be taking a look at the 2021 Special Exam 1. So I just had a quick go at this myself, wrote down some very rough solutions, so hopefully they're right. Um, but yeah, if anything's wrong then I'll probably upload a, another video in the future. Um, so yeah, shout out to Mr. James Mott as well who provided me with these photos. Link to his YouTube channel will be in the description. Uh, for some cool CAS UDF and uh, tricks and whatnot for Special Exam 2, so make sure to check that out. Um, but anyways, let's just jump straight into it. Question 1, um, find the acceleration. Uh, we're given a force and a mass, so A equals F over M. Um, so we're just going to divide that force by 10, so that's going to be a half I hat plus 6 over 5 J hat. Okay, initial velocity of the body is minus 3. So how do we find the velocity? Well, it's just the integral of acceleration. So this is the integral of a dt, but that's just a times t plus some constant vector c. But what is a times t? a times t is exactly a half i hat times t, or I guess a half t times i hat. And then we have a plus a 6 over 5 t times j hat. And since we want the velocity to be exactly minus 3 when t is equal to 0, that tells us that c should be minus 3j hat. So we can clean this up a little bit. So this is going to be a half t plus, um, and we're going to have 6 over 5 minus 3, oops, 6 over 5t actually, minus 3, and then j hat. Okay. Find the momentum of the body when t equals 2. So what is momentum? Um, let's just call it p of t maybe. This is equal to v of t times m. So the momentum at 2 is equal to v at 2 times 10. What is a v at 2? Well, it's going to be a half t. I forgot my i hat here. It's going to be, yeah, just i hat. Plus, and if you plug it 2 into here, what's going to happen? Well, we're going to get 12 over 5. So 12 over 5 minus 3. But that's equal to, well, 3 is 15 over 5. That's going to be minus 3 fifths. So we have i hat minus 3 fifths j hat. Question 2 evaluate this definite integral. So to do this, we can just split up the integrand. So this is the integral from 0 to 1 of 2x over x squared plus 1 dx plus the integral from 0 to 1 of 1 over x squared plus 1 dx. Notice that this guy is going to give us an arc tangent, and this guy over here well, notice that the numerator is exactly the derivative of the denominator. So in fact, if you integrate that, you're going to get the logarithm of x squared plus 1. If you want to show a bit more work here, you can let, for example, u be equal to x squared plus 1, and then du equals 2x dx, and then you'll get the integral of 1 over u. Uh, but you can just do, do this by inspection or something. Um, so log of x squared plus 1 from 0 to 1, plus the arc tangent, which is tan inverse of x, evaluated from 0 to 1. Notice that if you plug 0 into the logarithm there, you're going to get 0 because log of 1 is 0. Same for the 0 on the arc tangent. So this is equal to log base e of 1 squared plus 1, which is 2, plus the tan inverse of 1, which is pi and 4. Um, question 3. A company produces light globes, not light globes, light globes, um, normally distributed with a mean of 200 weeks. The standard deviation is 10 weeks. Customers complain that these globes last less than 200 weeks. Um, they do some kind of sample and they find it's 195 with a sample of 36. Okay, and we can use these guys over here. Write that the null and alternative hypothesis. Um, okay, so what's the null hypothesis? Well, we assume the original claim is true, so that's going to be mu equals 200, 
the alternative hypothesis, well, it looks like it's going down. They're complaining that yeah, it's lasting less. So this is a one tail, so we use less than 200. Determine the p-value. So how it defines p-value. Oops. That's not supposed to happen. So how it defines p-value? Well, that is the probability that x bar is less than 195. So the probability of getting something as extreme or more extreme than 195. And we assume that the null hypothesis is true, so mu equals 200. Okay, but what is that? We can standardize, so this is the probability that z is less than 195 minus the mean would be 200. The standard deviation of x bar would be the population standard deviation divided by a square root of n. What's the population standard deviation? It's 10. What's the population size? Not the population size, the sample size, sorry. So the n value is 36. So divide by root 36, which is 6. But that's the probability that a z is a less than, um, we have 5 over 5 thirds. Or you can write this as a z is less than, um, no, this is negative 5, sorry, 195 minus mm. 200 is minus 5. So z is less than 3. Negative 3. Okay, I don't know what's going on with my whiteboard here, so this should be minus 3. Okay, now how do we find the probability that z is less than minus 3? Well, we can use some geometry on the normal distribution. Um, well, since we know that the probability between minus 3 and 3 is, well, it was given up over here, it was 0.9973. So in here, 0.9973. So if you want the probability over here, then what you can do is take a half of 1 minus the probability that minus 3 is less than z is less than 3. So 1 minus the inside probability here is going to give you the tail end probabilities. You're only after one tail, so you divide by 2. So this is a half. 1 minus that probability is 1 minus 0 0.9973 which is 0 points zero, 0 that's going to give you 2, 7. So that's 0 points zero, zero, 0.00135. Okay. What should the company be told if the test was carried out at the 1% level of significance? Well, 1% while well, the alpha value is 0 0.01 and since um, P, which is equal to 0 0.00135, is less than the alpha value. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to reject H0 and favor H1. Uh, the company decides to produce a new type of light globe, 95% um, confidence interval. Random sample of 25, and we want the sample mean to be 250, the standard deviation of the population is 10. Okay, so we want to construct a 95% confidence interval for the mean. How do we do that? Well, what's the formula for confidence interval? It's mu minus, well, in this case, it's a 95% confidence interval, so we're going to use the value of um, 1.96. And we multiply this by the standard deviation of the sample. But that's going to be the population standard deviation, which is 10, divided by the square root of the sample size, which is 5. That's going to be 2. And then we also have mu. Actually, what I'll do, I'll write down the actual formula. So this is sigma over root n, and mu plus 1.96 sigma over root n. Um, and yeah, if you substitute in the values, this is 250 minus 1.96 times sigma is going to be, what is it, 10 over 5. And 250 minus 
times 10 over 5, so both of these are 2. Uh, what's 1.96 times 2? That's going to be 9 times 2 is 18, so 19, and 1 times 2 is 2 plus 1, which is 3, so 3.92. So let's compute this. So this is going to be 250 minus 3.92. So that's going to be 246.08. Um, and we also have a 253.92. Hopefully my arithmetic and all that is correct. Okay. Moving on. Next we have the sine wave, or the sine graph, and we want to find the volume when this region is revolved around the x-axis. So this is an integral we have to evaluate, so we have to evaluate the integral of pi function squared, which is sine squared of x and dx, from 0 to pi. Okay, so this is equal to pi integral from 0 to pi. If you want to evaluate sine squared, well recall up here that the cosine of 2x is equal to 1 minus 2 times the sine squared of x. So you can rearrange this for sine squared. So you get sine squared of x equals a half 1 minus cosine of 2x. So you can get a half factor out here then put 1 minus cosine of 2x dx. So this is pi on 2. Integrating we're going to get x minus a half by the chain rule sine of 2x from 0 to pi. Notice that if you plug 0 or pi into the sine of 2x function it's always 0 and if you plug 0 into the x it's also 0 so you can ignore that as well. So you just need to plug pi into that x, so that's going to give you pi squared over 2. Now consider the function y equals sine of kx, where k is a positive real constant, the region bounded by the graph of the function and the x-axis between the first two non-negative x-intercepts of the graph is rotated about the x-axis to follow a solid revolution. Okay, find the volume of this solid in terms of vs. So this guy over here is Vs, just write that down, Vs is pi squared over 2. Now, if you put a k inside of your function, you're applying a dilation from the y-axis by 1 over k. Which means, if you have this volume over here, as you increase k, that volume is going to decrease by a factor of k. So our initial volume was Vs. So if we have a dilation by a factor of 1 over k, that volume should also um, decrease by a factor of k. So we could write this as, yeah, well, it's just Vs divided by k. Okay, hopefully that's right. So question 5, find the gradient of the curve with this equation at the point 2 comma 1. Okay, so to save ourselves some products through at the start, we can rewrite this as e to the x plus 2y plus e to the 4y squared is equal to 2e to the y. And we can implicitly differentiate this guy. So derivative of this first exponential so the derivative of an exponential is an exponential. And we multiply this by the derivative of the inside, which is the exponent. Derivative of x is 1. Derivative of 2y is 2 dy dx. And then plus. Again, another exponential. So it stays. And multiply by the derivative of the inside, which is 8y. So that's the outside derivative. And then the inside derivative is just dy dx, so just a bit of chain rule there as well. And this is equal to zero, because the derivative of a constant is zero. Okay, we want to find dy dx at 2, 1. So let's plug, so we're going to sub x equals 2, 
and y equals 1. So if we do that, we're going to get e to the, that's going to be a fourth power because 2 plus 2 times 1 is 4. 1 plus 2, I'm going to write that as y prime, plus e, y is 1, so that's going to be e to the 4 again. And in that bracket, we have 8y. So that's going to be 8y prime. This is equal to 0. e to the fourth power isn't equal to 0, so we can cancel. And finally, we get 1 plus 10y prime is equal to 0. So in other words, y prime is equal to minus 1 tenth. Consider the three vectors, a, b, and c. c has this funny modulus thing. Find the values of p for which the three vectors are linearly independent. Um, so to find when they're linearly independent, let's find when they are actually linear dependent and then just take um, the opposite of that. So linear dependent. What we want to do is we want to find constants a or alpha times a plus a beta times b for which this is equal to um, c. So I'm going to write these as column vectors just so it's a little bit easier to get the equations from there. So we have minus 1, 6, minus 3 plus a beta 2 minus 8, 5, and this is equal to c, which is 3, 2, and this funny modulus thing. Not the modulus, absolute value thing. Okay. So from here we can come up with some equations. So we have a minus alpha plus a 2 beta must be equal to 3. We also have 6 alpha minus 8 beta is equal to 2, and minus 3 alpha plus 5 beta is equal to that funny absolute value thing. So the first equation, we can multiply that by 6, so we can add the first two together, so the alphas cancel. So we're just going to focus on kind of like these first two at the moment, because we don't want, really want to deal with this equation because that has that um, absolute value which is a bit nasty. So let's just we deal with the first two. So that first equation, we can turn that into minus 6 alpha plus 12 beta is equal to 18. So if we call this a star, and if we call this equation um, dagger, if we add these two equations together, what are you going to get? Uh, While well, the 6 alphas cancel, 12 beta minus 8 beta, that's going to be 4 beta, and 2 plus 18 is 20, which tells us that beta is equal to 5. Um, but how do we find what alpha is? Well, alpha, from the first equation, is equal to 2 beta minus 3. So 2 beta minus 3, that's going to be, well, 2 times 5 is 10 minus 3 is 7. Okay. So now we want to find, so we, have, we know alpha must be 5 and beta must be equal to 7. Let me just check my working. Again, so we have a beta. So minus 6 alpha and 6 alpha is going to cancel. 12 beta, that's going to be 4 beta. 18 plus 2 is 4. Okay, looks good. So now, if we take a look at the very final equation, we have a minus 3 times alpha, which is 7, plus 5 beta, 
for beta is 5, must be equal to 1 minus p squared in absolute values. So minus 30 times 7 is minus 21, then plus 25, that's going to be 4. So 4 is equal to 1 minus p squared in absolute values, um, which tells us that this absolute value thing can be equal to, sorry, not the absolute value, the thing inside the absolute value. So 1 minus p squared can be equal to plus or minus 4. Now the positive solution won't work, because if you take a look at 1 minus p squared, looks like that, 4 is all the way up here, so there's no chance that 1 minus p squared can be equal to 4, so we're looking at 1 minus p squared equals minus 4. So if we solve this now, we get p squared equals 5, or p equals plus or minus square root of 5. And I think that was what we're trying to do, find the values of p. Oh no, this is linear independence. So we found the values of p for which it is independent. So if we want independence, then we actually want, yeah, so plus or minus square root of 5. This is linear dependence. So if we want linear independence, let's put it up here, p can be anything except for minus root 5 and root 5. And that's going to ensure linear independence. So we'll go with that. Okay. The velocity of a particle satisfies this differential equation. So we have dx dt equals x sine t. Find an expression for x in terms of t. So let's solve this differential equation. So dx dt equals x sine t. Um, there's two variables in there, so let's use separation of variables. So let's bring the x's to the left. So dx over x is equal to sine t dt. Let's slap an integral on both sides. And we're going to get that natural log of x is equal to the cosine with a negative, so negative cosine of t plus some constant c. Um, let's exponentiate both sides, so we're going to get x, absolute value of x equals e to the minus cosine of t plus c or we can rewrite this as a, e to the minus cosine of t. Um, we want to get rid of those absolute values there, so let's bring that onto the other side by introducing a plus or minus on that a. But a plus or minus a, that's just a new constant, we'll just call it b. So x equals b, um, e to the minus cosine of t. Okay, let's plug in the initial conditions. So at t equals 0, x equals 1. So I'm going to sub t equals 0, x equals 1, let's see what happens. I'm going to get 1 equals b, e to the minus, cosine of 0 is 1. So this tells us that b equals e. So in the end, we have x equals e to the minus cosine t. But since that b constant is e, we have an e multiplied out here. But that's a bit funny to look at, so I'm going to rewrite this as e to the 1 minus cosine of t. Um, yeah, we'll go with that as the answer. Okay, find the maximum displacement of the particle and the times at which this occurs. So the maximum displacement, we want to x, sorry, we want to maximize this exponential function. Um, the way to x the way to maximize the exponential function is to maximize its exponents. So we want to maximize 1 minus cosine of t. So what does that look like? Well, cosine just looks like this. 1 minus cosine, what is reflected. And if we have a, a plus 1 on there, it's just going to translate up by 1. So your graph will look something like this. Um, so this is pi to pi 
3 pi, 4 pi, and so on. Um, and as you can see, these points up over here, if we keep going as well, those all lie at y equals, or actually x equals, um, let's just not call it x or y, let's just say 2. So those peaks occur at 2. So that means the maximum displacement, max displacement, is e to the 2. Um, and this happens for t is equal to, notice we have odd integer multiples of pi. So we can write this as 2k plus 1 times pi, where k is some um, integer. Okay. Um, is t positive? We'll assume t is positive, which in this case we'll have to re um, restrict this to positive integers. So we'll actually write this as um, 2k minus 1, I think that should work. Yeah, and we can restrict it to the positive integers, so z plus, or we can restrict it to n as well. Um, so you don't want to put a plus here because that's not going to capture the, the pi solution. So 2k minus 1. Okay. Solve z squared plus 2z plus 2 equals 0. Um, that's not too bad to do. Let's complete this with. So you can check that. That's z squared plus 2z plus 1 plus another one. That's going to be plus 2. Um, so z plus 1 squared equals minus 1 z plus 1 squared, oops, z plus 1 only, is equal to plus or minus i, so z equals minus 1 plus or minus i. Um, solve z squared plus 2z bar plus 2 equals 0. Um, couldn't really think of a nice way to do this, so what it actually ended up doing was I let z be equal to x plus i y, which tells us that z bar equals x minus i y. Um, yeah, so if we substitute this in, we're going to get x plus i y, but the whole thing squared, plus a 2 z bar, which is x minus i y, and then plus 2 equals 0. Um, okay, so if we expand this out, this is going to be x squared plus 2 x i y minus y squared, plus 2x minus 2iy, plus 2 equals 0. And now if you take a look at the left and the right hand side of this equation, we must have equality between the real and imaginary parts. So let's group up the real part. So we have x squared minus y squared plus 2x plus 2. That's the real part. Plus the imaginary part, which is 2xy minus 2y. So 2xy minus 2y, and then the real parts is x squared minus y squared plus 2x. Yep, we got everything. We'll also assume, since we're breaking up into really imaginary parts, we'll assume that x and y are real numbers. Because they're the real imaginary parts. Okay, so all of this is equal to 0. So what we must have is that the real part... is equal to 0, and the imaginary part, which is 2xy minus 2y, is equal to 0. Um, the second equation, we can write this as, what well, the 2's disappear. We can factor out the y, and we get x minus 1 is equal to 0. Okay, so from that second equation, we either have y equals 0, or x equals 1, using the factor law. Okay. So y equals 0, x equals 1. Um, so we want to find the solutions for z. So we better know what's... So if y equals 0, we better find the corresponding x value. If x equals 1, we better find the corresponding y values. So for y equals 1. So 
y equals zero, actually. y equals zero, what happens? We get, if we plug it into the first equation, we get x squared plus 2x plus 2 equals zero. But we just showed from before that that guy has no real solutions. And since we assumed x and y were real numbers, then this equation has no solution. So automatically, y equals zero wouldn't work because that would make x imaginary. Um, so for x equals one instead, if we plug in x equals one, what do we get? Well, we get one plus two plus two, which is five, minus y squared equals zero, or in other words, y is equal to plus or minus where root of five. So this works, this is real. So therefore z equals, um, we said z was x plus i y, so we have a one plus or minus i root five. Okay. Last question. So r of t is equal to, so this is two vector functions. Um, here's the domain, see it's just some positive real constants. I don't know why my whiteboard keeps zooming out like that. But first of all, we want to show that the Cartesian equation of the path of A is um, that ellipse. So how do we do that? So R of T, that's the equation for A. So we have X is equal to minus one plus four cosine of T. And Y is equal to two over root three sine of T. So if we solve for cosine and sine, we want to do that because we want to use the Pythagorean identity, which is sine squared plus cosine squared equals one. So we have cosine of t is equal to x plus one over four. And sine of t is equal to root three on two y. So what's cosine squared plus sine squared? It's x plus one over 4 squared plus root 3 over 2 y but squared is equal to 1. So here we're using cosine of x squared plus, if I write that out properly, see up here we're using cosine squared, this is not working, cosine squared of t plus the sine squared of t equals 1. Um, so yeah, that's where you get the equation from. So this is x plus 1 squared over 14 plus 3 quarters y squared. So 3y squared over 4 equals 1. That's what we wanted to show. Um, next, we want to show the Cartesian equation of the path particle A in the first quadrant can be written as this funny square roots thing. Okay, so we have this equation. Let's rearrange for y. So we have 3y squared over 4 is equal to 1 minus x plus 1 squared over 16. So multiplying both sides by 4 thirds, this tells us that y squared must be equal to um, 4 thirds, 1 minus x plus 1 but squared divided by 16. Let's take the square root on both sides. Now, usually we would take the plus or minus square root, but because we're in the first quadrant, y is positive, so we're going to take the positive branch. So we have the square root. We can actually take the square root of 4 thirds. Let's go ahead and do that. So that's going to be 2 over root 3. Um, square root of 1. Now I want to combine those two um, terms together. So I'm going to write 1 as 16 over 16 minus x plus 1 squared. Uh, while I'm at it, might as well expand it out. So x squared plus 2x plus 1 over 16. So this is equal to 2 over root 3. Square roots um, of 16 now here we have, let's just distribute negative into everything first, so we have a minus x squared 
minus 2x minus 1, but then we also have this plus 16, so that's plus 15. Uh, stop zooming out. Plus 15. All divided by 16. So getting closer, we have that quadratic in there. So now let's pull out that 16. That's going to give us a factor of 1 over 4. So we have 2 over root 3 times 1 over 4. So we're at of x squared minus 2x plus 15. And this is equal to um, 2 over 4. That's going to give us 2 in the denominator. And then we can rationalize. So if we multiply the top and the bottom by root 3. Uh, let's squeeze it in over here. So root 3 over root 3. Um, on the denominator, you're going to get 3. But 3 times 2 is 6. So that's where the root 3 over 6 comes from. So minus x squared minus 2x plus 15. And that was a bit of algebra to work through just for one mark. Um, but yeah, show that the particles A and B will collide. How do we show collision? Well, we need to show that the I components and the J components um, are the same at the exact same time. So first of all, let's equate the I components. And then we'll equate the J component and show that um, yeah, they happen at the exact same time. So I components. What are we going to have? We're going to have... What is that going to be? That's going to be minus 1 plus 4 cosine of t. And we set this equal to 3 secants of t minus 1. Okay. Now these ones are going to cancel, which is nice. Or minus 1 rather. So we get, now secants, we can write this as 1 over cosine of t. So if we rearrange this a little bit, we get cosine squared of t is equal to 3 quarters, or cosine of t is equal to plus or minus root 3 over 4. So that's going to be plus or minus root 3 divided by 2. Okay. So we're going to get a set of solutions for t here. Now since the period of, so this is an ellipse, the period of this, since there's just a single t in there, the period is 2 pi. So we can just consider the angles from 0 to 2 pi. We don't really need to worry about anything outside of that. Because, yeah, it will just repeat after 2 pi. So t is either going to be, there's actually going to be, let's take a look at cosine. So cosine is the x values. So it could be here, here, here or here. So there's actually four angles that it could be at. So pi on 6, 5 pi on 6, 7 pi on 6, or 11 pi on 6. That's the i components. Let's do the j components. Um, so we're going to equate the j components now. So what is that going to be? We're going to have 2 over root 3 sine is equal to 10. So 2 over root 3 sine of t is equal to the tangent of t, which is sine of t, over the cosine of t. Um, sine of t, we assume, we'll assume that sine of t isn't 0. That's not a problem, because if you take a look at the solutions for t, none of the t's are zeros or multiples of, or integer multiples of pi. So we can assume sine is not 0, so we can cancel. So we're going to get cosine of t. If we take the reciprocal of both sides is equal to root 3 over 2. And here t is equal to, well, there's only two solutions, namely pi on 6 or 11 pi on 6. As you can see, for the i components, the i components are the same for more angles. Um, the j components are only the same for these two angles, but these two guys over here, they'll they match over here. So there are... Um, yeah, it looks like there's two points of collision. 
so it happens at pi over 6 and 11 pi over 6. So hence, yeah, so basically what we've shown is the vector functions R and S have the same value when t is equal to pi over 6 or 11 pi over 6. So hence we want to find the coordinates of the points of collision of the two particles, so we can just take R of pi on 6 and um, R of 11 pi on 6 and see what happens. Yeah, that should work. So, let's see. What I'll do, since it's very annoying just to keep scrolling up, I'm going to take all of this here and just snipping tool down here, just so I don't have to keep scrolling. So let's figure this out. So what's r of pi on 6? Well, it's going to be equal to, so let's just deal with this guy first. So r of pi on 6 is going to be equal to um, minus 1 plus 4 of pi on 6. So 4 cosine of pi on 6. But cosine of pi and 6 is root 3 over 2. So i hat plus 2 over root 3. Sine of pi and 6, but that's going to be a half. So this is going to give us minus a 1 plus um, 2 root 3, or we can write this as root three, 2 root 3, minus 1 i hat. And then plus, so this is j hat, plus 1 over root 3 j hat. So root 3 over 3 j hat. That's one collision point. The other collision point, that was 11 pi on 6. So let's calculate that. That's minus 1 um, plus 4. Cosine of 11 pi on 6 is still root 3 over 2. So this is i hat plus... 2 root 3. Now we have the sine of 11 pi and 6, which is actually minus a half j hat. So that's going to be, yeah, the x component's the same, or the i component's the same, 2 root 3 minus 1 i hat. And then the j component's is going to pick up an extra negative sign, so root 3 over 3 j hat. Okay, um, next, show that the derivative of this ugly mass is equal to yeah, this for, they're really torturing you guys with this exam, with all the algebra and whatnot. Um, so let's try and do this. So let's calculate the derivative. So the first part, that's going to be 8. Derivative of arc sine is 1 over the square root of 1 minus the inside squared. So that's x plus 1 over 4, but the whole thing squared. And we're going to multiply this by... I should really use dot here because my x's look like times, and times one quarter. That's the inside derivative. Plus, now we have, let's bring out that one half and put big brackets here. Let's use product rule. So we have a v u dash. So if we call this a v, this u. What is a v u dash? Well, v u dash is the square root of minus x squared minus 2x plus 15. u dash is 1 plus a u v dash. So this is u. How do you differentiate a square root? Well, it's 1 over 2 times the square root. So you can just use power rule if you want to, but this is a nice shortcut. And then the inside derivative, which happens to be minus 2x minus 2. So differentiating that quadratic inside gives you minus 2x minus 2. And let's close that off. So now we want to show this is equal to this square root. Um, how do we do that? First of all, 8 and a quarter will cancel, and that's going to give you 2. So we have 2 over. Now what do we want to do? We want to show it equals to the square root here. We already have that square root right, right in here, which is nice. So we want to kind of, the idea is, we want to combine this term and this term over here, and hopefully they cancel out to something nice. Um, 
So in order to combine the two, let's actually write this, expand it as one minus x squared plus two x plus one over 16. And this looks oddly familiar to what we did up over above in part B, I think, or parts, yeah, part AI, where we had to show this. Um, yeah, we can basically use the same algebra. So that 16, so this one rather, we can write it as 16 over 16. And times, so what I'll do, instead of writing this whole thing out every single time, I'll actually just focus on this part here. Let's just focus on that part. So the yellow, so the yellow box is equal to that, but that's equal to two divided by, we have the square root of minus x squared minus two x plus 15. This is all divided by 16, but we can bring that square root of 16 out to become a factor of a quarter, and we can multiply that a quarter up to the top, which becomes eight. Okay. Now let's take a look at this part. So let's highlight this in blue, maybe. So the blue box now is equal to. Now notice we can bring on a factor of 2 here, so we can have minus 2x plus 1. So this actually becomes minus 2x plus 1, but the whole thing squared divided by 2, that's nice, so the 2's cancel, and then we're going to get the square root of minus x squared minus 2x plus 15. Okay, so this is an ugly mess, but let's try to simplify this a little bit more. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to write the yellow box first. So this is 8 over the square root of minus x squared minus 2x plus 15. And I'm going to write the blue box next. But what's the blue box? It is a half. So you still have this a half factor here. So plus a half. Now it's going to be minus a half actually because we have the negative here of x plus 1 squared divided by the square root of minus x squared minus 2x plus 15. And then finally we have a plus 1 half of just this a bit nicer square root which is the square root of minus x squared minus 2x plus 15. Okay, um, what can we do now? Well, notice what I'm going to do is I'm going to replace 8 with 16 over 2. Because what I want to do now is I want to combine these two fractions together. Now, we're also going to pull out that factor of a half that I just wrote down. So this is a half times 16 minus x plus 1, but squared, divided by the square root of minus x squared minus 2x plus 15. And then we still have a plus the square root of the quadratic. Okay, now if you take a look at the numerator in that first fraction, that's going to be equal to, now 16 minus x plus 1 squared, we've actually done that a couple times, um, that's actually going to be equal to minus x squared minus 2x plus 15. And then we divide by the square root of minus x squared minus 2x plus 15 and then plus a half, square root of minus x squared minus 2x plus 15. But the nice thing is, um, these square roots here, so we have something over the square root of the exact same thing. And what that reduces to is simply the square root of itself. So this is a half square root of x squared minus 2x plus 15, I'm actually getting so sick of writing this down every single time. And then plus a half minus x squared minus 2x plus 15. And this finally is equal to minus x squared minus 2x plus 15. 
well. So all that just for two marks. That took like, I don't know, five minutes to do, maybe even longer. Um, yeah, they really, really tortured you guys with the algebra. Um, yeah. Don't know if there's a simpler method to do it though, but that's probably how I would have done it. Just kind of brute force it. Anyways, so we've proven the derivative of this mess is equal to the square root. So we know the antiderivative of the square roots now. And now in this final question, we're asked to find the area underneath the square root with this exascaling factor. Um, yeah, so we can use the antiderivative that they gave us. So if we want to integrate from x equals 1 to x equals 2 root 3 minus 1 of square root of 3 over 6, square root of minus x squared minus 2x plus 15 dx. What is that going to be? It's root 3 over 6. Um, and we have a bigger bracket. The antiderivative of that square root is going to be the thing with the arc sign in it. Um, so let's try to copy that down. So that's going to be minus, not minus, 8 inverse sine x plus 1 over 4 plus x plus 1 square root of minus x squared minus 2x plus 15 divided by 2. And we evaluate from 1 to 2 root 3 minus 1. Now, what happens if we plug 2 root 3 minus 1 in? Well, just a note here. So notice we have these x plus 1s everywhere. So x plus 1 when x is equal to 2 root 3 minus 1 is going to be equal to 2 root 3. So whenever we see x plus 1, we can just replace with 2 root 3. So this is equal to root 3 over 6, um, 8, sine inverse, x plus 1, but that's 2 root 3 over 4, plus x plus 1, we know that's 2 root 3, square roots, and yeah, I don't want to be plugging in 2 root 3 into this x squared, but what we do know, if, yeah, hopefully you guys have seen the pattern by now, but minus x squared minus 2x plus 15, we can, instead of using this, we can replace it with, I think it was, yeah, 16 minus x plus 1 squared. And this is a, bit, a lot nicer because we know exactly what x plus 1 is. So this is 16 minus x plus 1 squared, what's 2 root 3 squared? Well, actually, well, yeah, 2 root 3 squared. And this is all divided by 2. We also have minus, so this is just one part of it, minus the lower bound, which is 8, sine inverse, of 1 plus 1 over 4, which is a half, plus, now if you plug 1 into everything on that Second term there, what are we going to get? We're going to get um, 1 plus 1, which is 2, divided by 2, so that's gone, and we're left with 16 minus 1 plus 1, which is 2 squared, which is 4. That's 12. But square root of 12, you can write that as, um, so 12 is 3 times 4, so that's 2 root 3. Okay, let's try to clean everything up now. So this is equal to root 3 over 6. Okay, there's a bracket missing. Um, we have 8 sine inverse of 2 root 3 over 4, which is just root 3 over 2. But that's going to be pi over 3. The sine inverse of 3 halves, sorry, root 3 over 2 is pi over 3. Then we have a plus. These 2s are gone. Um, 2 root 3 squared is exactly 12. 16 minus 12 is 4. Square root of 4 is 2. So this is 2. So overall we have 2 root 3. Minus sine inverse of a half is pi on 6. So we have 8 times pi on 6 plus 2 root 3. 
So we have plus two root three minus two root three, which is cancel, which is nice, leaving us. Um, come on, leaving us with root three over six times. Um, let's factor out an eight there. So we have pi on three minus pi on six, but that's pi on six. So we have root three over six times eight times pi on six, which is root three times pi times eight over 36. Um, we can cancel. So eight cancels with four. So that's going to be two. 36 divided by four is nine. Um, so, in the very end, it's 2 root 3 pi over 9. And yeah, we'll go for this as the answer. Um, that was, yeah, that was a bit disgusting towards the very end with all this algebra. Um, yeah, really didn't like this exam. Bit of a few weird questions as well, especially with the um, where was it? This complex question with the, the conjugate with the z that was a bit weird. Um, differentials, I mean, that was kind of like a standard differential equations question. Um, yeah, this one over here, that one was fine. I don't know why they had to put in absolute value of one minus p squared, that's just going to confuse people. Um, and yeah, solid of revolutions and just a false question. No, that wasn't the false question. That was probability and the false question. So yeah, I don't think I've seen hypothesis testing. Well, it's very rare to see hypothesis testing in exam one, but I guess it's in there. Um, so yeah, a bit of a strange exam. Don't know how to feel about it. Hated it towards the very end. So uh, if you, I mean, if you manage to get through all this algebra in the one hour, then kudos to you. Um, but yeah, if I hopefully most of these are right, if there are any major mistakes, I'll probably upload another video in the future. So that's all for today. Um, any questions, feel free to post them in the comments. And good luck for the rest of your exams.